Bonjour. Welcome to everybody. My name is, um, is Linda Witt. I'm the president of the Federation, uh, Fédération des Alliances Françaises USA. And I recognize a lot of your, the names that are coming up on the screen now. So welcome to all of you from Alliance Française chapters and from ATF chapters throughout the United States and uh, Canada because I think we had some, uh, have some attendees today from, uh, from Ottawa, if I'm not mistaken. So welcome to you all. I'm gonna make a couple of introductory announcements as we let people get into the room. And uh, you are in the right place if you're expecting to hear a session today on the French influence during the American Civil War. And uh, we want to show you just a teeny bit about the Alliance Française. I know that almost all of you in the audience today uh, certainly know about our network, but there are a few of you that, that do not. And, uh, you know, we're kind of proud to say that we're the largest Alliance Française network in the world uh, here in the United States. We have the most chapters and the most learners of French of any single um, Alliance Française network. Um, so we have about 25,000 students a year that we help uh, with their French. And we are located all across the United States and almost all of our chapters offer online lessons. So if you're not located really, really close to one for in-person lessons, then um, you can certainly pop in for online lessons. So uh, please join us if you aren't already a member of the Alliance Française. And then we also wanna tell you about some of our upcoming events. These are all free, uh, like today's event uh, to Alliance Française members and ATF members. Um, next Saturday, we're going to talk with the authors of the heart of the, uh, the heart of an artichoke, which is not at all about an artichoke, but which is actually about um, learning French and the challenges of learning French. Uh, it's an interesting book. It's written by a, an American, co-authored by an American and a French teacher. So uh, we'll have a nice discussion with them next Saturday. And that will be, as Melissa has indicated here on the slides, uh, in English. And then we have a session with a fabulous presenter um, from who does a lot of work with the Smithsonian, and he will be presenting on jazz in Paris, and that it is just going to be uh, fabulous. And gosh, I'm excited also about the a third one coming up. We have a, a French Frenchman who is a, a mostly known as a comedian, and he'll be discussing his latest novel. Hilarious, hilarious guy, and that one will be a mixture of English and French. And then we have Adrienne Leeds, who's one of the foremost experts in the world about living and investing in France. And she will be with us on July 30th. And then we have our favorite chef, Alain Lenotre, who will tell us how to make lava cake. I have no idea what lava cake is. Some of you in the audience probably do. Um, but if you don't know what it is and you wanna learn how to make it, then be sure to show up on September 21st on Zoom on all of these. And then we want to talk a little bit about the logistics for today's event. Uh, we want you to stay on mute during the presentation. I think you're all on mute now. Um, you do want to stay on speaker view because, uh, because we are going to be having slides throughout the presentation. And just know that on your device, you can adjust the size of the slide to, and you know, figure out to what extent you want to see the slide and see the speaker when Brad comes on here shortly. If you do have technical issues, and this happens every once in a while with Zoom, all we can tell you is to sign off and then come back on, all right, uh, using the original Zoom link. And then this event is being recorded for YouTube. You already got the notice, so we're legally covered there. And uh, that will be posted uh, early next week on our YouTube channel. We will send a reminder to all of you that the link is available in case you want to share the presentation with, with others. And our runtime today, we expect to be just, just about an hour. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. His name is Brad Stone. He volunteers as a docent at both the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland, and also aboard the USS Constellation in Baltimore Harbor. He has presented on a variety of Civil War topics at several major venues, including the Gettysburg Heritage Center in, of course, Gettys Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum National Park in Washington, DC, the Antietam National Battlefield Park in Antietam also, and the US Navy Museum at the Navy Yard in Washington, DC. Several of Brad's talks have been nationally televised on C-SPAN 3 American History TV. And with that, I will turn it over to Brad. 
Melissa will be um, Melissa Sora, our national programs administrator, who is based in Washington, DC. She'll be running his uh, PowerPoint and all the technology of today's event. Um, thank you, Melissa, and take it away, Brad. Well, thank you. I want to thank both Melissa, Linda, the Federation, and the French Embassy for helping to arrange this. I feel very honored to be giving this presentation. And if we could start with the first slide, uh, slide please. Um, the issue I'm talking about is something that's not very widely known, even in the United States, and that is the profound impact the Civil War had not only in America, but throughout the world, and how many countries throughout the world were not only acutely interested in what was going on during the Civil War, but also worked to try to influence the outcome of the Civil War. And France is one of the chief among them. And if we could go to the next slide, please. One of the themes of what's going on in the Civil War, as far as Europe is concerned, is that it's a clash of ideals. It's a, a struggle not only to determine the outcome of an individual nation, but a kind of government, Republican democracy. And in the 1860s, America is one of the only Republican democracies that succeeded, indeed, uh, that experiment of democratic rule had been tried in a number of countries, including France, and for the most part had failed at this point in France. Um, it's under the rule of um, Napoleon III, uh, an autocratic leader, and many people throughout Europe believe that that's the only form of government that works. And something that highlights this is a report noted by a New York Times correspondent who attended a party of senior French officials. And at one point, one of those officials goes up to an American who is new to France and says to him rather point blankly that the, the, uh, this is a, the, just near the beginning of the Civil War, that America will be destroyed by the Civil War. And you see the quote down here, it says, yes, it will. No republic ever stood so long and never will. Self-government is utopia. Sir, you must have a strong government as the only condition of long existence. And indeed, that's the view of many in Europe, but there's also the hope of many others in Europe that the union will prevail and that the form of Republican democracy that represents will not only succeed in the United States, but will ultimately return to other places like Europe. Next slide, please. So it's hard to overstate the influence France has during the Civil War, both directly and indirectly, um, on things like how the war is conducted militarily, how America will respond to this crisis in terms of its uh, medical system, uh, the geopolitical and philosophical issues that will shape the Civil War, both in the United States and uh, the European reaction to it, how uh, French nationals, French immigrants, uh, French Americans will all serve as combatants in the Civil War and as leaders on both sides of the Civil War, how France was a site of one of the decisive battles of the Civil War, and some of the enduring symbolism that will come out of the war that still resonate within both America and in France. Next slide, please. So to talk about France's influence in the military aspect of the Civil War, uh, Napoleon I and his tactics that were developed in the early part of the 19th century will dominate military thinking. Indeed, they're taught at all the top military academies in the United States, including West Point. And going into the war, and for much of the war, those Napoleonic tactics will be used by commanders on both sides. Now, in the years leading up to the Civil War, however, there are some fundamental changes in military technology that will make many of those tactics anachronistic and rather deadly. The principal change is the widespread introduction of rifled muskets. These are far uh, uh, more accurate and can uh, shoot at far further distances than the kind of smoothbore muskets that were used during the Napoleonic Wars. Now they're coupled with a very deadly type of ammunition. It's 
developed by a French army officer by the name of Claude Minet. Uh, we refer to it in the United States as the mini ball, and I'm holding one up here. This is a very big piece of lead. It looks white because it's oxidized. Um, this has a devastating impact on the body uh, when it goes into one of its victims. And indeed, uh, the use of the mini ball is responsible for 90% of the 200,000 battlefield deaths during the Civil War. It's also responsible for over 90% of the more than 400,000 uh, serious wounds of the Civil War. Many of these wounds are so grievous that they require amputation. Next slide, please. Now, the Civil War is the deadliest war in American history by far. It's estimated that from 750 to 850,000 Americans died during the war. The American medical system going into the Civil War is very ill prepared for it on a number of fronts. First, the quality of doctors. The accreditation of doctors and their education varies widely in the United States. Some doctors and some medical schools are excellent, many are not. And for those who want the best medical education before the Civil War, many of them are going to go to Europe because Europe, and particularly France, really sets the standard for it. For it. Um, the uh, Paris School of Medicine is regarded by many as the best. So the Civil War will serve as a catalyst for a great reform movement to bring American medical schools on a par with those in France. Now, another area that is uh, very problematic at the beginning of the war is the treatment of the wounded. Both sides of the Civil War, the Union, the Confederacy, think that they're going to win very quickly and rather you know, easily with, with little blood being shed. Well, by the end of the first year of the Civil War, both sides realized that that was not going to be the case. So once again, uh, particularly the Union is going to look to the innovations made by the French army during the Napoleonic War, particularly those made by French army surgeon, Dominique Jean Loret. He is one of the first people to develop first real-time systems for getting the wounded off the battlefield and getting them treatment at nearby medical facilities set up near the battlefield. He's also one of the first people to develop a system for prioritizing the treatment of the wounded, something that will later become the uh, triage system. Now, many of his innovations will be built upon by uh, one of the leading figures of the Civil War in medicine, Union Major Jonathan Letterman, who develops what's known as the Letterman system, which became the modern medical um, foundation for mass casualty evacuation and treatment systems. Now, finally, France will play a major role in addressing one of the major killers of the Civil War. And being with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, one of our, you know, uh, important things that we like to impart is that the major killer in the Civil War was not the battlefield. It was disease and illness. Indeed, for every one soldier who died from a battle-related condition, two died from disease and illness. One of the major killers, malaria. And the only effective treatment for malaria at the time was quinine. Well, French scientists in the early 19th century made the breakthrough discoveries to purify uh, quinine for pharmaceutical use. And shortly thereafter, American pharmaceutical companies, which are all located in the North, hire many French scientists to help develop the methods for the mass production of quinine. When the Civil War breaks out, Union forces have a tremendous advantage because the Union pharmaceutical industry can make all the quinine needed by the Union Army. For the South, they have no pharmaceutical industry. They can't even get the raw material for quinine because of the Union naval blockade. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the geopolitical factors that will determine what France's attitude will be during the Civil War, uh, to begin with, uh, the Confederacy desperately desires 
that it get the support of France. At the very least, they want to be recognized as a sovereign nation by France. They would like to get armed shipments from France and even some sort of military intervention from France. Um, and at the beginning of the war, it seems to many both in France and in the Confederacy, some of those may happen. Uh, there are a lot of factors that lead people to believe that, you know, France will intervene on behalf of the Confederacy. One of the major factors is that Napoleon III has a visceral dislike of the United States, even though he visited it. He did not like the United States. He did not like it for a number of reasons, including it was a Republican democracy, and he held that kind of government in contempt. But there's a practical reason why he uh, is happy to see a civil war. He wants to see uh, the Lincoln administration uh, rendered incapable of interfering with his plans, Napoleon's plans, for increasing French influence in the Western Hemisphere. Napoleon has a dream of a Latin America, and that's where we get the term. Uh, and it would be uh, a shield against what he feels is encroaching Anglo-Saxon influence throughout the world. And the key to his plan is to invade Mexico. And what he wants to do is he wants to unseat uh, another Republican democracy headed up by the democratically elected President Benito Juarez. So in 1862, he will invade Mexico. So his invasion of Mexico will occur at the same time the American Civil War is going on. And the key to his ability to do it is the fact that America is distracted in its own civil war. Another reason why France is maybe favorably disposed to the Confederacy is because it has the second largest textile industry in Europe. And it's heavily dependent on Confederate cotton at the beginning of the war. So on the surface, it looks pretty certain that the Confederacy is going to intervene for the South, at least to some degree. Next slide, please. However, there are forces going on both within France and uh, things being shaped by the Confederacy that increasingly make that like less likely. One of the big obstacles to it is the French foreign ministry. And that even includes the two foreign ministers that serve under Napoleon III during the course of the Civil War. First, Edward Trovanil, and secondly, his successor, Edward Dondouy. Both are opposed to any overt attempts to aid the South. And it's driven largely by um, caution and pragmatism. Both realize that yes, in some ways, a Confederate victory might help uh, the South, uh, pardon me, might help France, but they're also increasingly concerned that ultimately the Union is gonna win and that there are gonna be dire consequences for backing a loser. Um, Another problem they have comes about when Lincoln declares the Emancipation Proclamation, because that changes the nature of the war in many minds of Frenchmen from all walks of life. It is no longer a struggle about merely whether the United States will remain one nation. Now it changes it into a struggle of liberty versus slavery. And officially, France is for abolition. So to have them actively intervene on behalf of a state that supports the institution of slavery makes it much more politically problematic. The other thing that um, the French foreign ministry is increasingly looking at, and I'll explain why in a little bit, is how Lincoln in his administration are faring in elections. And again, as the war goes on, and as the Lincoln administration stays in power, the French become more and more convinced, no matter what's going on in the battlefield, they're convinced that Lincoln is probably going to win and the Union cause will win. The other major factor that starts to creep in as the war goes along is the French foreign ministry becomes more and more suspicious of what the Confederates' uh, intentions are should they win the war. They increasingly think that the 
the Confederates will want to expand to other places um, in the Western Hemisphere, and the most likely target would be Mexico, which would run directly counter to what the French ambitions are in Mexico. So for all those reasons, by the middle of the Civil War, uh, the French foreign ministry is more and more soured on the idea of in any way actively intervening on behalf of the Confederacy. Next slide, please. Now, diplomacy both is exercised uh, by the Confederates, by the Union, and by the French will play an important role on where France comes out in this struggle. Uh, the Confederacy is represented by John Slidell. He's a very talented lawyer prior to the Civil War. He's not a very good diplomat. He never really impresses the French. He never really provides the leadership in the Confederacy with useful insight as to what's going on within the French government. And at times he lets things slip in his conversations with the French that make them more and more anxious about what the Confederates' true intentions are. Now, on the other hand, the French are very well represented in the United States by many of their diplomats. This is at a time where countries don't have intelligence services per se. So a lot of the job of a diplomat is also to provide sort of intelligence analysis to their country. And France has an excellent diplomat by the name of Alfred Paul, who is the French consul in Richmond, Virginia, which is the Confederate capital. And from the outset, he's giving the French very useful insight as to what's going on in the war. And he tells them basically, if the Union has the will to win the war, they will, because they have overwhelming superiority in terms of their industry, materials, manpower. It's really the Union's war to lose. So don't pay attention to what's happening on the battlefield. Instead, again, pay attention to what's happening in the elections. If Lincoln's administration can stay in power, it's inevitable the Union will win. And increasingly, he is able to convince French leadership, with the exception of maybe Napoleon III, that that is the way to view things in terms of how the Civil War is going. And by the time Lincoln is able to win re-election 1864, the French government, for the most part, starts to make a noticeable tilt toward the Union. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of winning the hearts and minds of the Confederate, pardon me, of the French people, the Union and the Confederacy take vastly different approaches and they yield vastly different results. So the Union is very well represented by their counsel to Paris, John Bigelow. But there's a lot more to him than being counsel to Paris. In fact, he's running an extensive Union spy network throughout Europe. And he's also in charge of a union propaganda effort within France. But from the outside, outset, rather, when he arrives in France, he realizes the union doesn't have to do that. There are plenty of very gifted French intellectuals who are widely followed, who are strongly pro-union, and can make the union case far better than any American can. Two of these are Count Agnon de Gasparin, and the other one is Edouard de la Vallée. He cultivates them. He works his connections in Europe and in the United States to see that they get books published and that they're widely disseminated. And indeed, both of these uh, intellectuals write books that become phenomenal successes in France and throughout Europe. So successful that uh, Bigelow will use uh, the talents of some friends, including a very talented translator, Mary Louise Booth, and connections in the publishing industry with Charles Scribner, and see that these books are published within the United States. They become bestsellers in the United States, and they have the effect of swaying pro-unit unit and sentiment, sentiment, rather, even in the United States. They're so influential in the United States that even Abraham Lincoln has copies of these books, and they help convince Lincoln that there may be 
a lot of value in stressing the issue of emancipation more as one of the war aims of the Union. So this effort, again, relying on French intellectuals, is very successful. The Confederates take a far different approach. Next slide, please. The Confederate effort is head, headed up by Edward de Leon. He is a friend of uh, the Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. Um, he fancies himself a master propagandist. He is not. His main approach is to bribe French writers and reporters to push um, Confederate propaganda. At one point, he has over 200 uh, French writers in his employ. But the problem is, many of these are very minor writers, they're not influential, and many Frenchmen look at their works as being blatantly, you know, uh, pro Confederate propaganda. He also takes it upon himself to write his own works. And uh, he decides that the best way to promote the Confederate cause in France is by a very strident defense of the institution of slavery. And he bases a lot of his work on a French author and self-described ethnologist by the name of Arthur de Gobanon who uh, is a racist who says that Blacks are inherently inferior and can only do well under conditions of slavery. A uh, little side note, the Gobineau's works will also um, be given great heedance by um, Adolf Hitler later on. Now, uh, de Leon's work uh, was not very well received. Uh, for a number of reasons. The pro-slavery tack didn't work very well among the French. Also, uh, he thought that his work sounded pretty impartial, but it was pretty clearly seen by most French to be, you know, uh, very blatantly uh, one-sided. Also, big problem, he wasn't very fluent in French. And a lot of his work was seen as kind of indecipherable to many uh, French readers. One of the major, major problems, though, is he was very contemptuous of the French, and uh, he was very open about it in his correspondence. Unfortunately for him, that correspondence was intercepted by the Union Navy. So soon thereafter, Union newspapers uh, started publishing his unflattering remarks about the French, including the one that you see up above, which basically says that they're a mercenary lot. Understandably, that didn't go over very well in France, and he's soon sacked by the Confederate government. So the Confederate propaganda operations in uh, France are uh, a complete disaster. Next slide, please. Now, along the lines of Confederates kind of missing every opportunity to ingratiate themselves with the French, uh, the French declared neutrality at the beginning of the Civil War, and they basically said that, you know, French citizens shall not fight on either side of the war. Um, now, the Union and the Confederacy take different approaches. The Union respects this. They respect the property of French nationals in the United States, and they make no effort whatsoever to conscript uh, French uh, nationals in the Union Army. The Confederacy, somewhat paradoxically, uh, does not respect uh, French national property in many respects. They, um, they uh, destroy some, they confiscate other properties. Um, and there's sort of an ongoing effort throughout the Confederacy to conscript French nationals in the uh, Confederate army. And that does not get well received in, in France at all. Next slide. Now, despite the official prohibition from uh, French nationals joining either army during the Civil War, many nonetheless do uh, join, and there's no real repercussion for it. One of the most notable for the French army is Camille Lamont, Jules Marie, Prince de Ponier. Um, he had fought in the uh, Crimean War. He left the French army and at the beginning of the Civil War. He volunteers for service with the Confederacy. They give him command of a Texas brigade. And this is kind of an unusual pairing. You have Texans uh, trying to wrap their head around being commanded by 
a French prince. And indeed, many of them can't even pronounce his name. So they refer to him as Prince Polecat. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar for, with what a Texan means by polecat, if we could go to the next slide, please. This is what they mean, a skunk. And here we see America's favorite French skunk, Pepe Le Pew. And I just want to point out that Pepe is wearing a kepi. Now, I have a kepi here. A kepi is kind of the iconic headgear of both armies during the Civil War. And the kepi is adopted directly from the French army, which had been using it since the 1830s. So again, it's another indication of how uh, influential the French were on the military operations of the Civil War. But if we could go back to the last slide, please. So Prince Polniak has a rather good sense of humor. He's not offended by being called Polcat, and he uses it to good purpose when he leads their, his men into their first major battle. He's on horseback, he gets up on his stirrups, and he yells to them, follow me. You call me Polcat, I will show you whether I am Polcat or Polniak. And he led them to victory, and he will be a very successful commander for the Confederacy ultimately promoted to the rank of major general. At the, toward the end of the Civil War, he's given a secret mission to run the Union blockade, get to France, and personally plead with Napoleon III to intervene on behalf of the Confederacy. Unfortunately for him, by the time he reaches there, the war for all practical purposes is over. But for all of his services to the Confederacy, he's renowned as the Lafayette of the Confederacy. Next slide, please. And next slide, thank you. Now, the Union has veritable royal flush of volunteers for its ranks, uh, primarily Prince Philippe d'Orleans, Count de Paris, heir apparent to the French throne uh, upon the abdication of his grandfather, who was the King of France in 1848. Many indeed consider him to be the legitimate King of France, but he is forced into exile. He is a passionate advocate for the cause of Republican democracy. So he and his brother, Prince Robert, go personally to Lincoln and ask for commissions in the Union Army. Lincoln appoints them both captains in the Union Army and places them on the staff of Major General George McClellan, who heads up the largest Union Army at the time, the Army of the Potomac. They will distinguish themselves uh, with their service, particularly during the Peninsula Campaign. Now they're joined by their uncle, Francois de Orleans, Prince de Jeanville, uh, who incredibly is deaf, but still serves as a very capable staff officer. Um, he in turn also has a son uh, by the name of Pierre and Pierre will serve as an ensign in the Union Navy throughout the, uh, throughout the Civil War. Next slide, please. Now, French immigrants serve on both sides of the Civil War. Overwhelmingly, French immigrants to the United States in the years prior to the Civil War had settled in the North and primarily in Union, uh, pardon me, urban settings. And like many ethnic and national groups at the beginning of the Civil War, they gravitate toward units that are comprised of their compatriots. And there are some notable um, French uh, American Union units, uh, in, including the 53rd Zouaves. Uh, but one of the most noteworthy is the New York 55th uh, Gods de la, pardon me, Gods Lafayette Regiment, which is under the command of then Colonel Regis de Trobon. Now, he's a very interesting individual. He is a French aristocrat, but as the war uh, breaks out, he becomes a naturalized American citizen. He drops his title. He becomes a very effective Union commander, and he will ultimately achieve the rank of Major General in the Union Army. Next slide, please. Now, um, French Americans in, in the South, far fewer of them, uh, they tend to concentrate along the coast of Texas and in Louisiana, particularly in urban areas like uh, New Orleans. And like uh, French Americans in the North, they tend to gravitate toward 
French American units. And there are some notable ones, uh, the Légion Francais and the Brigade Francais of New Orleans, among others. Next slide, please. But the big influence in terms of uh, France in uh, both the Union Confederate Army aren't units comprised of French nationals or French immigrants. Rather, it's a type of unit that proliferates on both sides of the Civil War. They're called Zouaves. And indeed, these units become so widely seen on both sides of the Civil War that Parisian newspaper in, the, uh, in 1861 will run the headline, Il plus des Zouaves. It's raining Zouaves. Zouaves are a unit of the French army that had been developed from their North African campaign. They're based on uh, a North African tribe that were renowned for their uh, battle dress and for their ferocity. And shortly thereafter, the French army incorporates units wearing those types of uni uniforms made up of Frenchmen that will serve as light infantry. They're kind of crack regiments of the French army that will serve the French army from the 1830s all the way to the early 1960s. They're renowned for their courage, their tenacity, and they really proved themselves on the fighting fields during the Crimean War. And their exploits capture attention throughout the world, including in the Northern part, particularly of the United States. So in the years leading up to the Civil War, a lot of uh, elite drill units, Zouave drill units will be created. They become a big form of entertainment. One of the most elite and well-renowned is organized by Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, who's a very prominent figure in Illinois. He's a close friend of the Lincolns. When the war starts, his unit is incorporated into the Union Army. And even before the first major battle of the Civil War, Ellsworth takes it upon himself to cross the Potomac River from Washington, enter Alexandria, Virginia, and occupy Alexandria, Virginia for the Union. When he goes into the city, he sees a large Confederate flag hanging from a hotel. He himself goes into the hotel, he grabs that flag, he tears it down, and as you can see from the panel at the lower right, he's immediately shot mortally by the owner of the hotel. The owner in turn is almost instantly killed by one of Ellsworth's men. These two deaths are regarded by many as the first casualties of the Civil War. Now, because he's a prominent man throughout the Union and also a close personal friend of the Lincolns, Ellsworth becomes the first major martyr for the Union cause. Next slide, please. Uh, now, there are legendary uh, Zouab units on both sides. For the Confederacy, undoubtedly the most is the Louisiana Tigers. Now, they're comprised at the beginning mainly of Irish immigrants from the docks of, of New Orleans. Uh, they will expand to include other groups from many other walks of life and nationalities, including some French Americans. They are renowned for their uh, fighting ability, some would say savagery on the battlefield, uh, particularly at the first major battle of the Civil War, the Battle of Bull Run. Um, they are a tough group. In fact, one of their commanders has to shoot one of the soldiers in the face in order to gain authority over them. But they are great fighters and they serve in every major battle of the Eastern theater of the Civil War. And uh, their you know, tenacity cost them because by the, by the end of the Civil War, of the thousand men that started with the original unit, only about 373 remain by the end of the war. Next slide, please. Now there are far more uh, Union Swab units, over 70. Uh, many of them distinguish themselves like the New York 5th Volunteer Infantry and the 114th uh, Pennsylvania Volunteers. Uh, one of the things about Zwabs is they were unlike other more traditional infantry units in both armies. They didn't follow the close formation attack method that went back to the Napoleonic era. 
Rather, they tended to attack in far looser, more reactive formations that are far more similar to what we use in combat today. And this proved to be very effective for them. As a matter of fact, Union General Lou Wallace credited the Zouave fighting style with winning one of the first major battles for the Union in the West, the capture of Fort Donelson. Now, sadly, uh, about an hour before the Confederate forces of Robert E. Lee surrendered to General Grant, which will mark the end in large part of the Civil War, a soldier uh, of the 5th Union Corps Zouave Brigade is killed which lead made to say that among the first and the last casualties of the Civil War were Zouaves. Next slide, please. Now, no talk about French influence in the Civil War would be complete without talking about Vivandiers. Vivandiers were French women who had followed the French army from the late 18th century on. Uh, they would go with them on the march and camp and in battle. They would uh, do many of the important support functions for uh, the French army. Uh, they would man the military hospitals. They would enter aid to the wounded on the battlefield. And they made a big name for themselves during the Crimean War. And they inspired a lot of Union women at the beginning of the Civil War to become their own Vivandiers, to join Union forces and these Union Vivandiers also were renowned for their exploits. Next slide, please. The most noteworthy and the most heralded of all was French Mary Tepe. She was a French woman. She uh, came to the United States, settled in Philadelphia, and when her husband at the outset of the war joined the Union 27th Pennsylvania Infantry, she went with him. She was known for carrying huge uh, casks of whiskey and water for the men on the march and in battle. Uh, in camp, she would carry out uh, important functions, managing supplies, working in the hospital. And in battle, she would go out, tend to the wounded, and in several instances, also fight alongside the men. She first made a name for herself at the first battle of Bull Run. When her husband betrayed her, she would leave the 27th unit, but would ultimately join the 114th Pennsylvania Regiment, which was a Zouab unit. As you can see, she's kind of dressed as a Zouab. She fought in every major battle of the Eastern uh, Theater of the Civil War and was renowned again for her bravery. So much so that she earned one of the highest honors in the Union Army, the Kearney Cross Medal. She would continue fighting until around the time that the war was wrapping up. When she died in 1901, she was widely mourned by veterans of the Union Army throughout the United States. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of French Americans who, who served uh, as leaders on both sides of the Civil War, for the Confederacy, the most prominent is General P.G.T. Beauregard. Uh, he was born from a Creole family in Louisiana, West Point graduate, served with distinction in the Army until Louisiana seceded from the Union. He personally orders the firing of the first shots of the Civil War with the bombardment of Fort Sumter in 1861. He will distinguish himself uh, in the Battle of Bull Run, leading Confederate forces. He will, be, uh, he will go on to lead Confederate forces to varying degrees of success in other battles throughout the war. He's one of only several, seven um, Confederate generals that reached the top rank of general in the Confederate army. But despite all that, he is not very highly regarded by many Confederate leaders, most especially the uh, president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis. Both men have a few that last through the Civil War and even after the Civil War. Next slide, please. On the Union side, the most distinguished uh, French American is Rear Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont. He is a member of the DuPont dynasty. The DuPonts provide nearly all the um, gunpowder to Union forces during the Civil War. But he sets out on his own career in the US Navy and has a very distinguished one 
And at the outset of the Civil War, he's given command of what up until that time is the largest U.S. Navy fleet ever. And he uses it to good purpose. In November of 1861, he will lead the capture of Fort Royal, I mean, Port Royal, South Carolina, which is the first major Union naval victory. And for that, he is elevated to the newly created rank of Rear Admiral. He will pioneer the use of a new type of ship that emerges during the Civil War, the steam-powered, armored, heavily gunned ship known then as the ironclad, known today as the battleship. For those of us in the uh, Washington area, Washington, D.C. area, DuPont Circle is named in his honor. Next slide, please. So speaking of the Navy, one of the most decisive battles of the Civil War is fought in France, known as the Battle of Cherbourg. Uh, Union merchant shipping had been terrorized by Confederate raiding ships. They did great damage to Union and American shipping. Uh, one of the most notorious ships was the CSS Alabama. It uh, destroyed dozens and dozens of Union vessels, but by June of 1864, it was in bad need of repair, so pulled into Cherbourg Harbor for those repairs. Unfortunately for the Confederates, a Union uh, warship, the Kearsage, detects the presence of the uh, Alabama, and it waits in the international waters outside of Cherbourg to pounce on the Alabama once it comes out of the harbor. Well, the Confederates become aware that the Kearsage is out of there, the Confederates plead with the French government to give the Alabama safe sanctuary. The French say, no, we're a neutral nation. The Alabama has to leave within a few days. And so on June 19th, 1864, French warships escort the Alabama to the three mile limit where it faces off with the Kearsage in international waters. Now, thousands of French people gather along the shores or take to their boats to watch this battle. Most of them are rooting for the Confederate ship, the Alabama. Doesn't work out very well for the Alabama though, because within an hour it's sunk. Uh, and one of the factors that naval historians, and indeed some French officers at the time note, is that one of, the, one of the big advantages the Union Navy seems to have is the quality of their gunpowder it seems to be much more potent than what the uh, Confederates have. That gunpowder is supplied by the DuPont Company. Now, I'll just draw your attention. Oh, I should mention, uh, it is a decisive battle because once the Alabama sinks, that in large part takes away much of the Confederate threat to Union merchant shipping. So it's a profoundly important battle for the Union. Now, I just wanna draw your attention to the painting on the right entitled The Battle of the Kearsage in Alabama. If it looks familiar, it's because it was painted by a great French artist. Next slide, please. Edward Manet. He painted this, completed it within a month of the battle. He did it even though he didn't witness the battle. He uh, based it on the observations made by others who did. Uh, the painting now hangs in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Next slide, please. Uh, now, the ties between Cherbourg and the Civil War have grown in the last few decades. In 1984, a French uh, Navy warship discovered the wreck of the Alabama about seven miles off the coast of Cherbourg. Subsequent joint uh, French and American excavations of the site have yielded a lot of artifacts, including a very large cannon, which is now on display at a museum in Cherbourg. And in 2004, the American Civil War Preservation Trust took the unprecedented step of designated, designating rather Cherbourg City Cemetery as the first official overseas American battlefield site. Um, the graves of two Confederate sailors and one Union sailor lie in that cemetery. I want to note that the Union sailor was not an American. He was actually a British national, which again highlights the international uh, aspect of the Civil War. Next slide, please. 
Now, finally, as the Civil War goes on, there's more and more admiration for Abraham Lincoln, even among those who initially um, were kind of sympathetic to the South. Uh, this is for a number of reasons. One, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, made an enormous difference. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was more and more seen as a man who was liberating millions of people. But also there was more and more respect for his leadership ability, uh, particularly within the French government, again, with the possible exception of Napoleon III. Um, so by the end of the war, he's, he's very widely respected. And when he's assassinated, that brings about an enormous outpouring of grief, uh, sadness and solidarity for the Union cause. Indeed, in April of 1865, hundreds of Parisian students defy local authorities and flood the streets of Paris to show their solidarity with the Union. Throughout France, people from all walks of life are trying to contribute to uh, enterprises such as uh, buying a gold medal to present to Mrs. Lincoln to express France's sympathy and solidarity. But Edouard de la Belle takes that moment to come up with something far more profound and, and bolder. He suggests that what France should do would be to create an enormous statue in honor of the achievement of, this, of, of the Union winning the Civil War and of showing the bonds between these two nations and also the shared goal of liberty. And um, his suggestion will be built upon um, by the noted sculptor Frederick Auguste Bartoli, and uh, with the assistance of others like Gustav Eiffel, who's also known for some other structures, eventually it will become what we call the Statue of Liberty and will be installed in New York Harbor in uh, the 1880s. The name of this statue, though, is technically or actually Liberty Enlightening the World. And de la Belle has that in mind. He wants the statue not only to commemorate this victory of a Republican democracy, but also to serve as a beacon to other nations, especially France, to come back to the cause of liberty. Next slide, please. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I've enjoyed giving it. Um, and again, I hope it outlines, uh, outlines all the ways that France really had such a massive impact on the Civil War. Uh, again, how it affected military doctrine and technology, how Fran France's advances in medicine shaped the development of the modern American medical system, how French intellectuals shaped attitudes toward the war and bolstered the cause of the North, not only in Europe, but within America itself. How French nationals, French immigrants, French Americans played a significant role, not only in fighting for both sides of the Civil War, but in serving in leadership positions. How French inspired Zouave units helped modernize military tactics, how the Vivandier movement really opened up greater opportunities for women to serve in the military, how the Battle of Cherbourg uh, was a decisive Union victory and highlighted the international scope of the Civil War. And finally, that basically the Civil War profoundly affected both America and France in ways that still resonate to this very day. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the sources I used for this presentation. And uh, you know, I encourage you to read all of them. Um, and I think, you know, you can form your own opinions uh, about this, but I, I think they really do open up a new appreciation for what an international um, event the Civil War was. Next slide, please. And to contact me, here's my contact information. Next slide, please. And of course, I'm open up to any questions. And I will point out, if we have some extra time in my research for this talk, I found out some very interesting public health information that may be of value to any of those of you who are planning a trip to Paris anytime soon. I'm saying this somewhat tongue in cheek, but it's a heck of a story. 
So anyway, with that, um, thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brad. That was really, really wonderful and, and riveting, I have to say. Um, I, we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, I, I'll start off, I'll just do them in order. Um, and so the first one is, what was the role of French Freemasons in the Civil War and, uh, and later for American democracy? Well, Freemasonry plays a very important part um, in the United States and abroad in terms of um, promoting certain ideals. And, and it's very um, sympathetic to the idea of Republican democracy. And indeed, I can't tell you how many American presidents were, were Freemasons and the influence that you know, they had um, in the development of this country. And likewise, uh, Freemasonry in other parts of the world also tended to be very sympathetic to the Union cause and to other causes um, promoting, you know, Republican dem democratic governments. Oh, sorry, I needed to unmute myself. Um, how much do you have any idea in, in your research of, 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 of the impact that the French Civil War might have had on the French economy? How, how much our Civil War had on, on the French economy? Yes. Well, it's interesting. Uh, there was this famous line uh, by, by a very prominent uh, Confederate or pro-Confederate uh, senator leading into the Civil War that cotton was king and that no one would dare cross the Confederacy or the South because cotton was so indispensable, uh, no nation that depended on textiles, you know, could live without it. Well, a few problems with that theory. Uh, cotton was indeed a very valuable commodity. And initially both uh, the textile industry in England and in France was very nervous about what would happen should they not get adequate supplies of cotton from the American South. As it turned out, the Confederates kind of shot themselves in the foot because during the first year of the war, what they decided to do is hold back on supplying cotton and sort of blackmail both the governments of France and uh, England into saying, they said to them in fact, if you want cotton, it would be good for you to recognize the Confederacy as a sovereign nation. Well, that wasn't possible for both France and England at the time. What ultimately happened is England developed its own supply of cotton from India and France bought from the British. So by the second, third year of the Civil War, the loss of Confederate cotton really didn't have that much of an impact on either Britain or France, um, and there wasn't really anything else the French exported. So it had a minimal impact on the French economy. One of the reasons why the French foreign ministry didn't want to intercede on behalf of the, uh, of the Confederacy is they, would, they were very worried what the impact would be if uh, there was an embargo of certain union products that France uh, really depended on, like wheat, that would have had devastating impact on France's economy. So overall, it was negligible. Oh, okay, thank you. And a question from Gloria. Uh, we all want to know how um, Tepe's husband betrayed her. Um, he uh, was a gambler uh, and a thief, and he basically um, stole all her money and just left her. Uh, not a very nice individual. Um, so um, she did eventually get remarried. Um, the post-war years were not very good for her. She suffered from some uh, chronic injuries from the wounds that she uh, suffered, particularly one at Fredericksburg. Um, and in 1901, sadly to say, she committed suicide. Wow, wow. Um, very interesting uh, woman there. Uh, I, I read on uh, Wikipedia as well that her, when her husband um, stole from her, he was very drunk that night. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yes, yes, not, not a quality person. <laughs>
Yes. Yeah. So she was she was well rid of him. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, and then one final question, and then we're just about out of time uh, from one of the audience members from Mo. How was uh, how was Albert Pike, uh, who was in the South, treated in the war? Did you come across Albert Albert Pike in your in your research? Uh, um, uh, to be truthful with you, I, no, I'm not. I'm not aware of. Albert Pike. Um, he may have been, played a very prominent role, but I, that just didn't come up in my research. Okay. All right. Didn't come up. In, and, and then um, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't think I see, uh, Melissa, do you see any other questions? No. And Melissa did tell me, uh, and, and Brad or shared with me that there is a, because we find the Zouaves in your presentation so fascinating. There's an expression in, fan, in French, faire le Zouave. So we we put the explanation of that in French in the um, in the chat for anybody that's interested. And um, with that, I think we'll call it a wrap. And thank you everybody for joining us today. And special thanks to our wonderful presenter, Brad Stone. Merci and uh, bon weekend à tout le monde. Au revoir. Au revoir.